substitute, or really a insert a little bit, because Rick brought up the subject of fear last week. If you remember what he talked about, he said that uh, one of the things that uh, Satan does is he lies, uh, bring a focus on the temporal and not on the spiritual realities. And there are four areas that he brought up, fear, hunger, anger, and lonely, loneliness, okay? Uh, we're talking about fear today, and as Rick brought it up, when you're in the state of depression or starting down the state of depression, one of the things that Satan brings up lies about things and causes you great fear. And it's interesting, if we go back the other way, when sometimes you're afraid of something for a long period of time, it draws you to be in a state of depression. So it's kind of a... And then if you look at this, if uh, depression causes fear and fear causes depression, what it is is like it could be a very big downward spiral that you just fear, depression, fear, depression, fear, depression, okay? So we want to look at fear from a uh, standpoint of, first of all, let's just define it and talk about some of the things that people fear today where fear crops up. Let's, let's just talk about that and bring attention to it. What are the things that... When I'll start it out. Um, one of the things that I have is a fear of heights. Okay? And I didn't realize I had a fear of heights, especially, I, well, I thought I did. And then the, my uh, first real big job, and I was in high school, I worked for a construction company. And the first day on the job, I had to work with the superintendent to break down um, scaffolding that was four, four stories high. <laughs> <laughs> and after a while, being on the scaffolding all the time, being a mason laborer, I, I learned to kind of do away with fear. But now, when I think back on those things, you ever get those, those things? That's a sign of it, old age, by the way. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 says, one of the things that marks you when you're getting older is that you have fears of things, including fear of heights. And I never knew you had a fear of heights until you went to Canada. Oh, well, Canada, eh? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah, so we were walked out on this platform over, that hung out over this this big valley, okay, and uh, uh, it was glass. plexiglass, okay, so you looked through it, and it's like, <laughs> it just gave me the heebie-jeebies thinking about that, but Jim helped me walk beyond where my fear was and walk out there, but I didn't spend a whole lot of time out there either. Did you do the Eiffel Tower or in Paris? No, no. Anyway, so fear of heights, what else? Has, what else Maybe you or someone you know uh, has a fear. What are some of the fears that people have? The dark. Of what? The dark. The dark. Oh, yeah. Okay, what else? Snakes. Snakes. Oh, there's all kinds of things. Public speaking. Oh. Yeah. Fear of death. Okay, yeah. Anything else? What are you afraid of, Sam? <laughs> I'm not afraid of anything. No, 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 in reality, okay? There are things that I don't do because I'm very uncomfortable, but I don't think I think I'm, a, I'm fearful of them, okay? Right. You know, I, th I thought about this on the way here, spiders, snakes, and things like this that you just don't like, but are you fear, you know, fear to me is a, you know, you shake inside. Yeah. You know, yeah. You lose your mind. You don't know what to do. I think that uh, I'm just going to put up this in quotation marks and put news because a lot of people are fearful of what comes on the news today. Um, so can we find another chair for Camilo here? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, when I say the news, there are people who watch the news constantly. Okay, and when they see the news, they see the riots and they see the, the destruction of cities and, you know, they're looking out their window thinking that those destructions are going to be right there and are right with them. So they, you know, or they hear about a hurricane. Yeah. Oh no, the hurricane's going to come and get us. My friend Renee is just terrified that she's going to get killed in a hurricane. Yeah, so that, you know, whatever's on the news, okay, it's kind of like the hypochondriac that that reads about things, uh, symptoms of different diseases, okay? And then they feel like they have it. Or in the news, you might, everybody's convinced that in the news, I mean, everybody was watching the news about this COVID thing, and next thing you know, it's gonna get, you know, it's gonna get all of us. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, what else? Fear of the unknown. Say that again. Fear of the unknown. Yeah, no. Oh, the unknown. Yeah. Yeah. Fear of the unknown. Exactly. And the, uh, well, fear of failure. Ooh. Or you're just lost in general. They're just lost? Lost. Yeah, I mean, people, you know, when they say they require a certain amount of stuff, they yeah. become very fearful of, I had an uncle, his wife, my aunt, would come over and visit. He didn't want to leave the house because he wanted to, he was afraid somebody would come in and get stuff. Yeah. Well, that's a lot. A lot of people are afraid when they see the news. A lot of it is that they're afraid, A, number one, they're going to die, or number two, they're going to lose their stuff, okay, or they're going to lose their comfort. I'm going to be uncomfortable for a while. Okay, well, I want to get, what's that, Sam? Because I know somebody that's just fearful of people. Like Renee, she's terrified of other people because she sees them as a source of uh, criticism. Uh, not a feeling of her. Mm. Okay, so she loves being by herself, working in jobs. The one job she's had is where she could be by herself doing the job. Oh, wow. Yeah. Which is kind of. Uh, that, there's a name for that, too, fearful people. What it would be? People phobia. Right? People phobia. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what I want to do is play. If you go to all these, okay, the reason fear of heights is afraid you're going to fall and die, right? Uh, fear of the unknown. Your fear is gonna. You don't know where it's gonna take you, but it's gonna. Afraid it's gonna lead you to death. Fear of the dark. You don't know what's out there to get you to take you down. Fear of death. Okay. Um, snakes. The reason we we're fear, fearful of snakes is that there might be a cobra out there to strike me and I'll die. Right. Or fear of public speaking. I like that. Do you have fear of public speaking? Okay, but yeah, you know, they say that. Uh, most people do have a fear of public speaking. Uh, and so, fear of public speaking is afraid that you will be embarrassed or that somehow you will die, right? Die from embarrassment. <laughs> All right, the fear of, fear of failure is, the bottom line of that fear of failure is a lot of times we, we, we uh, are um, motivated by uh, our achievements and feel if we don't achieve enough because it's that. Same thing. We can achieve enough, and, and so we'll not die. But uh, whatever, whatever it is, what I want to deal with is just taking this big one that's right in front of us, and it's the fear of death. And it has. It's interesting when you talk about fear, including the fear of death. People can be motivated, or actually manipulated, when they have by fear. How do uh, you know, when you go to a communist country and they walk around with big sticks that get people into submission because people are afraid they're going to die. And so they keep bringing that up. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, and then Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. Second Timothy chapter one and verse seven. Oh Lord, I it's on the line. What's that? It's on the line. Well, there you go. It should be. You read it there, Simeon. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of law and of a sound mind. Okay, so let's just look at this. When there's fear, would you say that that fear? Unless we're focusing in on death here, but. See that fear. Is that fear of death from God? Okay. It says the spirit, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind or a disciplined mind. Okay? And so that, that's come from God. So the first thing, when we recognize we have this fear that is overwhelming us, that's not from God. Who's it from? Same. All right. Let's look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 15 through 17. 
Sure. Romans 8, 15 through 17. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. <laughs> the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs of Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I, let me just ask you, where... Where's fear in that account? It says, God did not give us the spirit of fear. So fear is not from God, right? It says it's um, a spirit of slavery. Fear ah! Of spirit of slavery. Okay. Slavery. Fear is slavery. It brings you into bondage. Okay? And you make choices that are not good because you're in bondage to that, that thing that's causing you to fear. We're talking about the fear of death, and we're talking about how the fear of death has been a slavery that, that Satan has been using from the get-go. All right? Uh, but what has God given to us? Let's just go back and say, what has God given to us in the place of fear? He's given us a, a cry in our hearts, right, by the Spirit of God. So He's given us the Holy Spirit to overcome that fear, and the Holy Spirit does what within us? Causes us to cry to God, right? Have a Father. So that is a that is a sign and seal of our relationship with God, that He is our Father. Okay, so what are we afraid of when God is our Father? He's going to take care of us, right? When we look to Him, so He's not giving us the spirit of fear, but of of, uh, he's given us this, this Holy Spirit that calls Abba Father. He lets us know that we are God's children. Okay, so when we face this time of fear, it calls us, hey, we start to fear even death itself. Let's remember our relationship with God because He is our Father in heaven, right? Um, let's look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. And 15. This is important for us to understand and hold on to. When we talk about the fear of death. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Larry, do you have that? Uh, yeah, I do. Who gave him of himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. And, oh, I'm sorry, I've got Titus 2. I was going to say, that did not quite sound like Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Okay, what does that tell us about the fear of death right away? You've been delivered. Okay, well, okay, we've been delivered, right? Very good. What else? All right. This has come from the devil. What else? It is his tactic, the fear of death, his tactic to bring us into slavery. With the fear of death. How would that play out in the garden? Genesis chapter 3. How would that play out in the garden? Okay. How did Satan use the fear of death play out in the garden to cause Adam and Eve to sin. Okay, what did he bring up? The fact that they were going to miss out on life. They're going to miss out on life. Because they won't. They said, if you don't eat of this, you're going to miss out. Okay? So it's a temptation that he brings us, draws us in. Okay? So, it comes from Satan, but what's the thing? He, he came to deliver us. How did he deliver us? How did Jesus Christ deliver us? He experienced everything we did, even death itself. Exactly. And, and conquered it. He came out on the other side, okay, and he conquered death. So, all right, let's just put it together here. God says you, he's not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and sound mind. He has given us the spirit whereby we cry out the Father. His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, defeated Satan and death itself. Okay, this is what is for you. When you look at death, should we be scared of death? Should we fear death? 
Okay, let's go, let's go a little bit deeper here. Revelation chapter 1, 17 and 18. Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Or they're Buddhist or whatever, 
I may think that they become a turtle or a frog or, uh, or a reincarnation of some sort. Okay, it's not some kind of ridiculous thing. I, and they don't want to admit the fact that, boom, as soon as you die, you're before God. Okay? All right, so let's just, let's just chase the rabbit here, not of the non-believer, but of the believer. Okay? So we understand where we are in this picture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to look at several things there. We're going to hold our finger in 2 Corinthians 5 and turn to Philippians chapter 1. But, so go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, first of all, verses 6 through 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Mr. Glenn, do you have that? So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body than at home with the Lord. So what does that tell us that death, what does death bring? The presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord. That's why we celebrate a believer at the at a funeral or a memorial service because it's called a homecoming. They just went home. Where where is it in the Psalms that blessed in the eyes of the Lord is the death of the saints? I'm thinking 116, but I'm that was great comfort to me. Yeah. Blessed in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. That's not because God's out there looking, I'm gonna kill this person, I'm gonna kill No, it's that as soon as you die, you're coming home. You will never, never suffer another day. So you would you say that today we're just like in the garden we fear death because we fear of losing out more life from Because we, we are under the impression, I hate to use it, but that beer commercial, well, I don't forget which one it was, it doesn't get any better than this. Okay, we're under the impression... That's where, that's where people are today. It doesn't get any better than this. And then they live in disappointment because they realize this is not that great. Okay, and we say it doesn't get any, it's not that it doesn't get any better than this. There's a whole lot that's better than this. This is even a scratch on the surface compared to what we have. So it's a homecoming. Now hold your finger there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 because there he says, I'd rather be at home with the Lord. I'd rather have this homecoming than be here. But what does he say in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21? Very familiar words. Most of you probably know them. But I might have to the body to be present to the Lord. Remain to live as Christ and to die as he. Okay. The only place this is gain, this is gain for the people that are living for Christ, for Christ now. When we take our eyes off of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're living for ourselves, this does not look like gain to go home and be with the Lord, does it? All right? It, does, it doesn't look like that. And that also stops us to say, okay, if uh, this is so much gain, why don't I just kill myself? No, it's only gain when we're living for Christ. So even if it, you know, you're hanging on and you say, uh, you know, what good am I? God says, I have a purpose for you here, and you live every second of every day for Christ. And then with that, what will happen is more, this will look like gain, and so this is not a bad thing when that happens. You're living for Christ. Even to your last breath is to live for Christ. Does that make sense? All right, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look at verses 1 through 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. This gives us a little insight here. Uh, Heath, are you still there? Yeah. All right. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked, but while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. 
And he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. All right, let's just, let's just break that down for a second. Number one, there's, I believe that this, uh, this is pre-resurrection form in heaven. It's, I, I believe it's a picture of that, but also in the resurrection, the resurrected form, okay? So what he's saying is, I really believe this, that when we look at, when people die and go to heaven, they're not just like stacked up spirits up there, you know, like in a, what, what do they call that, a crypt? Yeah, okay. They're not just stacked up and said, oh, okay, they're in heaven. No, there's a joy for enjoying there. So there's, this is, I believe this is a pre-resurrection where he says, we know that this tent of our earthly home is destroyed. We have a building. Okay, there's something up there, that, okay, in this pre-resurrected state, people are enjoying heaven. We look at Revelation. People that are there are enjoying it. It's an enjoyable experience. Okay, and it's not just spirit floating around. They're there. What they're, he says, they're, they're put on this heavenly body. All right. Now we realize, as we'll talk more about that in 1 Corinthians 15 in a moment, after the resurrection, our bodies, our literal bodies, come out of the grave. And if we have been disintegrated over the years or whatever, it comes out of the grave and instantaneously, he says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, how fast is that? Okay, if you just blink, it's about a hundred times faster than your blank. I don't know. That's just an estimate. Okay? Alright, so that'd be very fast, right? And our bodies come out of the grave. Okay? And and it says our bodies are instantly changed. Something that's immortal. So, but in the meantime, before the resurrection, these people are here. Matter of fact, they come back. When Jesus come back, they come back with him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Okay? And 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Alright, so, <clears throat> just for the record here, then he says it's a heavenly dwelling, if indeed we put away, put on, uh, may not be found naked, but he says, while we're still in this tent, we groan. How many of you ever groan? More and more the older I get. Yeah, yeah, we groan. Because we're longing for something better. Alright, so, we groan, and, uh, but notice what he says. The guarantee of this and this is the fact that we have the Holy Spirit in us. He is the guarantee. How do you know you're going to... The Holy Spirit is at work within me. How do you know? Because He draws us to pray. How do you know? Because He answers us when we're under the preaching of His Word and the reading of His Word. Okay? How do we know? Because He's nudging us and saying... You need to repent of that sin. That's all the working of the Holy Spirit. Thank God for that. Because it's a guarantee of what we have in the future. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. You want to read it, Sam? You see what, or are you going to sing it? After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. How many more? Verse 10. Okay. Can it? Okay, hey. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Okay, that gives us an indication a little bit about what this pre-resurrected state is like. Right? They're active in heaven. There's an activity there. And it's giving praise to God. And that's why what really throws me off is that people in heaven are looking down on us. You know, and they're so proud of me when I, or somebody when they hit a home run, you know. It's like, I know that my mama's smiling at Okay, if your mom is in heaven, she couldn't care less about what you're doing right now because she is so she's enthroned, enthroned with the very fact that she's in the presence of the Holy One. Okay, so let's get things straight. Mama's not watching you from heaven. Okay, she is watching one thing, and that's the throne. And she's participating in the greatest song festival that has ever um, been known from creation. 
Seeing worthy is the Lamb. All right, and while you're in Revelation chapter 7 there, Sam, read verses 15 through 17. Oh, Revelation chapter oh, Revelation chapter 7, verses 15, 15, 16, yeah, yeah, 15 yeah. through 17. All right. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun beat down on them, nor any heat, for the Lamb in the center of the throne shall be their shepherd, and shall guide them to springs of the water of life, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Okay, so if this is what homecoming is like, this is what homecoming is like, this is where it really doesn't get any better than this. But it will after the resurrection. Okay? But for the believer, while they're waiting for this resurrection, it doesn't get any better than that. All right, so let's talk about the resurrection. First of all, we need to see, see the resurrection with 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. What do we do? Where do we turn for help in these times of fear? Fear clouds the way. Okay? And because of that, we sometimes get all worked up and everything else. What can we do? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. We're going to break down several things in 1 Corinthians 15. So follow with me because this is good stuff. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you first of importance, but I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. All right, so the first thing he says, you're going to be saved. One of the things we're being saved from is fear. Okay, he says you are being saved. You're saved by this gospel. The gospel has drawn you to the Lord Jesus Christ to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, right? But he says there's also a saving effect by reviewing this gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So you are being saved. One of the things you're being saved from is fear, including the fear of death. You go back, you need to preach the gospel to yourself. Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And of course, then he goes on to say he was seen to Cephas or Peter, and then he was seen in the twelve, and then of over five hundred brothers at one time. The greater part are remained at this day, and some are falling asleep. First Corinthians 15, look at verses 12 through 19. He said, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, which he has, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are found to be misrepresenting God because we testify that God, uh, that about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. And if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins, and those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And Christ, uh, in Christ... If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are, of all people, to, most to be pitied. Okay, so, he said, let's just use the, the argument. Okay, let's just say, as people say, he didn't rise from the dead. Okay, if he didn't raise from the dead, then everything is futile. Doesn't work, mean anything. And not only that, the people that have died are not alive. There is no hope. So take the resurrection of Christ out of the picture. The resurrection of Christ. Because if he did not rise from the dead, there is no resurrection. And if there is no resurrection, there is no hope of life after death. And so when you look at how people are miserable today, they deny that Christ died and was raised from the dead. And so they live like that. Okay? There is no afterlife. Or they try to calm themselves with a lie about the afterlife. And because of that, they don't believe Christ has died and raised from the dead. And so when they look at death, death is the ultimate end. end. 
There is no better thing. So in this life, they're saying it doesn't get any better than this, but then that's not too great. Okay, the believer says, this life is nothing. I don't care how good it is. This is nothing compared to what the glory that should be revealed in us. All right, let's jump down to verses uh, 15 through 23. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What, what's the first fruits indicate? There's more to come, buddy. Okay, if he's raised from the dead, which we believe, which we have the accounts that people saw him raised from the dead, there's more to come. For as, man, for as by man uh, came death, and by man has also come to resurrection, as Adam all die, so then Christ shall all be made alive, each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then those uh, at, at his coming who belong to him. Then look at verses, verses 50 through 58. This is, a, this is what we look, look forward to. He says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And then he kind of makes fun of it. He quotes in the Old Testament uh, passage in the book of Hosea, I believe it is. Oh, or maybe it's, uh, no, Haggai. Uh, o oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, the strength. Uh, the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that you're, uh, in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Wow! All right, the resurrection. All right, Christ returns with a trumpet sound. <laughs> Have you ever stopped thinking about this? Okay, we have a, a round... A round globe, right? That is perfectly round. All right. So, let's just say, where's he going to return? It's all going to happen so fast. I know. And we're still going to hear that. Everybody on earth is going to hear this trumpet. Okay? But before you realize you've heard the trumpet, you'll be caught up with him. Okay? First Thessalonians says so you'll be caught up with him in the clouds. Can we, you know that people that aren't showing up in one year the And mourn for him. Because they will be raised too at that time. The, the dead will be raised according to the book of Revelation chapter 22. Or chapter 20. Right? So, anyway, so we have the resurrection and it happens in the moment of the wink of an eye. And then we'll be with Christ. I mean, if you have been in this pre-resurrected state, you are coming back with Him, with the Lord and the saints, and they will be reunited with their bodies. Wow! Okay? And they will be raised, they will be caught up with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wow! Okay? Is that exciting? That's our hope, folks. So, when people say they're afraid of death, okay, when there are, people try to hold us in bondage with this fear, be, be afraid, be afraid. And bottom line is we're afraid to die. Christians are not afraid to die. What's our future look like? The future means death now we're with the Lord. Okay? Regardless of when whatever, we're going to look forward to the resurrection. You can't get any better than that. And forever be with the Lord. Wow. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Let's just... Drive this home with one more scripture here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Let's understand the difference between a believer and a non-believer on this subject of death. Someone read that? Is it 13? Yeah. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do, who have no hope. Ah, there's the right there. 
Do you understand the difference of a Christian grief versus a non-Christian grief? Have you ever seen it? Okay, Christians grieve for a loss of a loved one, but they understand. This is for a moment. This is not the end. Okay? And when I worked as a chauffeur, I would do funerals from time to time. Mm -hmm. You could tell where there was hope and where there was not hope oh. in that service. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, from from wailing and, and just awful mourning to mm -hmm. joyful send-off celebration. Exactly. No, you're, you're so right there. That is, is, is a little, just a world of difference. The sad part about it is uh, the people who have no hope try to compensate to make up something for hope. You know, you'll see them again someday. Mm. Or your mama's in heaven. Okay. When my mother was diagnosed with cancer, that cried about two and a half hours. She died. And he cried. Hmm. Yeah, you know, that's, exa that's exactly what remember David had his son who was very sick and he, he mourned and he cried and he fasted and prayed and then once the child was dead, he cleaned himself up. It's the end. Okay. Um, I have a whole lot more, but I, have, I don't have any time, so. Um, Homework. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to cover this one last point here, because I really encourage you to go through the promises of God that I listed on, on the sheet, but I want you to notice the counter to fear that God has given to us. Turn to Isaiah chapter 26 verses 3 and 4, and then 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses uh, 6 and 7. Isaiah chapter 26 verses 3 and 4, and on these two notes we will close, but this is the counter to fear, which is peace. Okay, we have fear... Okay, fear crops up and fears from Satan and Jesus drives away that fear and what God gives us in place of fear is peace. Someone read Isaiah 26 verses 3 and 4, please. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. An everlasting rock. Okay, let's notice that the peace comes whose mind is where? Stay. It is locked in on God. Here's where our peace is thrown out when we're watching the news. Okay, or we're in social media. And we hear about all the junk going on in the world. And we get all scared and worked up. Mind stay on Him. Get back to the rock. Get back to where you belong. And notice it's not just peace, it's what? Perfect peace. Perfect peace. One other scripture, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. If Bruce Black were here, you hear this, Bruce? If you're watching this, I've missed you today. You could be <laughs> quoting this. Okay, so um, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, so what's the, what's the antidote to fear? Anxiety is nothing but fear, right? We're anxious about something, so it's a fear. So what's the antidote? Prayer! Thanksgiving! Let your request be made known to God. What God gives to us is a peace that passes all understand. Well, the homework assignment, as Heath mentioned, yeah, I'll give you homework. So, as you anticipate meeting with Rick next week, uh, give him a good reason to let you know that you did your homework. Go through the, the scriptures I put on there talking about the promises of God and what God gives to us as examples in His Word to keep us from the abundance of fear. Rick will be back, Lord willing, next week with another in his 13 lesson series on depression.